All right, we are going to get started. My name is Margo Landman. I'm Senior Director for Education Programs here at the committee. And it is a real pleasure to introduce Xu Zijian. You have his bio, but what it doesn't say is that while he was working on his PhD at Columbia, I worked there. <laughs> so we go back quite some distance, and it's really a pleasure to be able to welcome all of you and to welcome him to talk about a very important and interesting study that has just been done on young, and he'll tell you what young means, <laughs> <laughs> attitudes towards democracy and other very critical issues on Taiwan. So without further ado, I will turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Uh, thank you all for coming today. Uh, my name is Su Chen Shu. Uh, I won't spend too much time introducing myself, but let me spend the first few minutes introducing our organization, Taiwan Foundation for Democracy. Uh, it, is, uh, it was established in 2003 uh, based on a cross-party resolution in our, our parliament. It's 100% funded uh, by taxpayers' money. So just think it's a Taiwanese version of NED. <laughs> Basically, that, that uh, was it. Actually, uh, Carl Gorshman played a very important role in terms of um, pushing ahead the, the creation of our foundation. So uh, the topic I'm going to talk about today is political profile of Taiwanese, Taiwan's youth. And the reason why I talk about this is because in 2014, there was a very important political movement in Taiwan that is the Sunflower Movement. So I'm not that young, but I was personally involved <coughs> in that movement and a lot of my students too. I was teaching uh, part-time at National Tsinghua University. And so uh, not only from Tsinghua, but also many campuses, uh, a lot of young people were involved. So people say after that, uh, political movement, there was a new political generation born in Taiwan. <coughs> and uh, there is a term describing them. Uh, in Chinese, it's called Tian uh, Du. They are naturally born pro-independence. Okay. So, but on the other hand, there are some other studies saying uh, the Taiwanese young people are not that committed to self-defense. Now we don't have a conscription system. So if you combine these two things together, what does that tell you? That the young generation craving for independence, but not committed to self-defense, some kind of disaster. <laughs> Destabilizing factor, not only for Taiwan, but also for the region, right? bad news. But let me tell you, it's not true <laughs> today, according to my data. So today I'm going to talk about three things. Okay, the first is democratic support, the second natural independence, so to speak, and the third commitment to defense. Okay, so uh, yeah, this is the three issues, uh, dem democratic support, the preference of um, future of cross trade relations and commitment to defense. The reason why we like to talk about democratic support uh, has to do with something, uh, a study uh, in the Journal of Democracy 2016. Uh, there's a study uh, arguing that in the West, mainly in US and, and uh, Europe, there's a decreasing support for democracy among young people. And uh, this is some kind of um, <coughs> crisis for democracy. So is there a parallel phenomenon in Taiwan, right? Uh, the picture that I gave you was already bad, that the, the, the message. So if the Taiwanese young people are not committed to democracy, that will be even worse, right? So these are the phenomena that we worry about. Basically, are Taiwanese young people irresponsible Responsibly passionate and naively, idealistically, that, that's the question. So that, that 
uh, we just finished uh, a recent wave of survey. We do uh, two waves of survey every year, our institution, uh, foundation. Uh, but since, uh, sorry, since 2011, mm -hmm. uh, we have been uh, doing the, this uh, uh, survey uh, twice a year. Uh, one wave was about uh, uh, Taiwanese people's attitude toward democracy, and another wave uh, about uh, their attitude to social inequality issues. <coughs> so in this survey, because the question I would, I would like to ask is whether uh, there is a difference between young people and the other age cohort about this issue. So I oversampled uh, the youth, young people. The definition of young people actually are those people under the age of 40, 40. And then I further uh, break that group into two groups, that is the, those under 30, as those between 30 and 40. So I'll compare these groups. So as you can see, uh, the ordinary population percentage in Taiwan, sorry, uh, the age under 30 is 38, but I oversample them to 50, around 50. So that's the progress. Okay, so this is some of the trend ab about uh, the young people's commitment to democracy. Uh, so the question goes that there exist some problems in democracy, but it is still the best political system. Do you agree or not? And the, as you can see, so, sorry. Those people, uh, the red line on the top is the 20 to 39, right? So they are always on the, uh, the highest percentage of young people uh, agreeing with that. And in general, that uh, percentage is going up, okay? And the second, those people are satisfied with the current situation of democracy in Taiwan. Again, young people are on the top, right? But as you can see, there is here, it's, it's lower lowest point, which is 2014. Could you just, because it might be some hard for some people in the back to see that, could you tell us what the okay. different um, levels of ages are, and what the different colors are? Yeah. Okay, sorry. From here, the purple one is those uh, over 60. And the second line, the dark red, is those between 40 and 59. And the light red is those under 40. And this dark line is the average. Okay? okay? So young people's uh, commitment to democracy is always higher than other age cohorts. Uh, when you ask them if they are satisfied with the, with the democracy, although it was not as high as the previous question, but young people are still the highest uh, age group. As, and as you can see, there is a low point in 2014. As I mentioned, there was this political movement, the Sunflower Movement. That was uh, during Ma Jo's second term. And gradually it comes up a little bit and the third question is, are you optimistic about Taiwan's democratic development in the future, say, 10 years? And again, uh, the young people is among the highest um, uh, in comparison with other age cohorts. So this is the, the study that I mentioned, Boa and Monk in 2016 in Journal of Democracy, and the title is Democratic Discontent. Uh, as you can see, their question, we, we ask different questions, a little bit different, but the same nature. Their question is, having a democratic political system is a bad or very bad way to run this country. Okay, do you agree or not? Okay, our question is, do you feel good or bad if we have an authoritarian regime in our country? Okay, those feel good uh, is the answer. So as you can see, the green one is Taiwan, the, the red one is Europe, the blue one is United States. Uh, and uh, 
in the age between 16 and 24, in Taiwan is those between 20 and 24, uh, people who support authoritarian regime, United States has the highest percentage. Europe sec second, and Taiwan the least. And the direction goes different. The Europe and US goes like this. The younger the generation, the more support for authoritarian system. Whereas in Taiwan, it's the other way around. Okay, so this is a comparison between uh, Taiwanese young people's support for democracy. It, in short, we don't have a crisis of democratic discontent in Taiwan. Quite the other way around. Young people in Taiwan has much stronger support for democracy in comparison with other age cohort, especially if you look at here, you know, they have, there's a very strong, in Taiwan, very strong tendency for supporting authoritarian political order. Okay, so this is the conclusion. Unlike in the West, support for democratic political system is always high, and even higher among youngsters. There's a very low support for authoritarian alternative. And there's a relatively low democratic satisfaction and democratic optimism. Of course, because we have a lot of concerned citizens, very critical of our government, no matter who is in, in power. Uh, but the young people still have relatively high degree of satisfaction and optimism in other age cohort. So this is, answers my first question about uh, democratic value. The second question is about cross regulations. This is uh, usually this is the way we present peoples uh, in Taiwan uh, their attitude toward uh, cross regulations. There are six categories uh, for answer. Uh, on the one extreme, you have uh, the cross. Uh, we should uh, declare independence immediately. This is on the one extreme. The other extreme is we should have unification immediately, okay? And next to them, you have let's maintain status quo and pursue independence in the future. Next to that, you have we maintain status quo and pursue unification later. So now you have four options. In the middle, you have two options, maintain status quo and talk about it later, or we think about it later, okay? Another one is status quo forever. So you have six options. Among the six, the highest is you always uh, maintain status quo and decide later. It's always the highest. You know, people usually, you know, uh, escape into that category. You know, uh, and the next highest is the blue one is maintain status quo forever. So this is the mainstream of Taiwanese public opinion on cross regulations. If you ask the six category questions, the lowest is always the option for pursuing unification immediately. <laughs> it's always the lowest very stable. The next lowest is declare independence immediately. Okay? And then this pink one, as you can see in the beginning is higher, then it's going lo lower and lower, is maintain status quo and pursue unification later. In the beginning, in 94, 95, it was relatively high, but then it's coming down. And, and could you again do this, because those numbers are very small. Say it starts in 94? Starts in 94. And the midpoint is what? Or just in the middle, just so we get a sense. It's what, 95? Zero, uh, oh 05. Oh and here is 17, 2017, last year. And this blue one is going up. <coughs> The blue one is maintain status quo. Uh, no, 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 I mean, sorry, this green one. This green one is maintain status quo and pursue independence later. 
So as you can see, there is a change in tendency, but there is also a stability of maintained status quo. But this is the usual way we ask. And we have some other alternative way to ask that. So if but so we have six categories, right? If we combine two into three, that's simple. Simpler unification, status quo, or independence, the tendency, right? As we can see, status quo is always the highest. But then if we separate into young people versus other uh, older age cohort, when, when I have circle, it means there's statistic significance in, in terms of difference, right? The young people is always less pro-unification, more pro-independence, and more pro-status quo. <coughs> so first of all, when we say <coughs> young people are born pro-independence, actually we mean, first of all, they are pro-status quo, okay? Pro-status quo and less pro-unification. A little bit more pro-independence, but independence as a category is not the most important one. The most important one is status quo. So let's not get the wrong impression about young people in Taiwan. And here, as I said, if we break further the young people into those, uh, those between two, 20 and 29, 30 and 39, and those beyond 40. Again, we can see uh, there's significant, there's even significant difference between the youngest group, that's 20 between, 20, between 20 and 29, there are more, how should I say, less tendency toward a unification than the 30 to 39. So the younger the age, the less uh, 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 they are declined to, they are inclined to uh, support unification. Uh, but there's no, no, a significant difference here. So the youngest generation in Taiwan, they're very resistant to the idea of unification. That is the message here. Um, okay, so I have, we have another way to ask this question. This, this another way is provided by Professor Wu Naidu from the Institute for Sociology of Academia Sinica. He asked another two questions. First question is, uh, if China democratizes, is democratized, do you think we should be unified with China? Okay? It's not that if China, uh, China's economic develops, it has nothing to do with economics, it has to do with democracy. If China is a democracy, should we be unified with China? Agree or not agree, okay? Still, those disagree, the young people are much higher than those uh, above 40. And those agree, there's, again, a significant difference here. So even China is, becomes a democracy, the young people in Taiwan, they still disagree with unification. Another question is, if declaring Taiwan independence will not cause a war. Uh, that's a big if, I know. <laughs> but it's a test of the people's attitude, right? Would you support independence? There is a significant difference between young people and age uh, above 40 on the agree part, okay? And the next is a little bit more complicated. If we cross tab these two questions, okay, cross tab. Let me explain to you. <coughs> Conditional independence, <coughs> agree or not agree, right? <coughs> Conditional unification, agree or not agree. Then we have four types. <coughs> if you agree on independence, the, but. Uh, you agree on independence, but not agree on unification, that is Taiwanese nationalism, right? You agree on the independence issue, but not agree on the democratic China unification, then you are 
the type of nation, Taiwanese nationalism. And the other way around, if you agree on unification with a democratic China, but not agree on a peaceful unification, a peaceful independence, then you are Chinese nationalism. If you agree on both, <laughs> both are OK. What does that mean? OK, you are pragmatic. It can go either way. That's OK, pragmatism. But if you say no on both, what does that mean? The current situation is the best. I don't want any change. That means real status quo. So you have four types. Taiwan nationalism, Chinese nationalism, pragmatism, and status quo. We think this is a more precise measurement of people's attitude. And look at the percentage of distribution. Actually, it's very interesting. Those people who are pragmatism, actually, is the least group. See, people, people in Taiwan have strong opinion. <laughs> and this is an easy choice. So oh, I agree on both. It should be an easy choice, but actually, this is the smallest group. People have strong opinion on this issue. Taiwan nationalism is 26.5%. But it is not the biggest. The biggest one is status quo, 31.3%, almost one third. And the Chinese nationalism, actually, not that small, 18.7%. OK? This is interesting. Then, Let's break down with age cohort. Actually, OK, the green one is 20 to 29. Red one is 30 to 39. The blue one is above 40. Interesting. Among young people, actually, status quo is the biggest group. Status quo is the biggest group. And the youngest group, 20 to 29, they're even bigger. There is a significant difference with the group of 30 to 39. So when we talk about Taiwanese young people naturally born pro-independence, actually, they are more pro-status quo. They want to keep the status quo, particularly the youngest age cohort. This is something that I intuitively I could not perceive. You have to rely on data. This is very interesting, because I didn't imagine that either in advance. Taiwanese nationalism, of course, those beyond the below 40, they have much stronger Taiwanese nationalism than the older age cohort. Whereas in the older age cohort has much stronger ta ta uh, Chinese nationalism than the younger cohort. Taiwanese youth under 40, like the, their older age cohort, are predominantly pro-status quo. This is the most obvious message. So Taiwanese under 40 are significantly less pro-unification than the older cohort. So with Wunaido's classification, the Taiwanese youth under 40 have significantly stronger Taiwanese nationalism and weaker Chinese nationalism and they are significantly pro-status quo. However, the cohort under 30 are significantly more pro-status quo than the 30 to 40. So there's, here's another question. I don't know if you are aware. Recently, there's uh, this new policy made by uh, Beijing for Taiwan that is the, so to speak, 31 measures benefiting Taiwan. But we don't say benefit. Actually, benefit China, not benefit Taiwan. Uh, but this has to do with economic statecraft. So we're also asking this question regarding young people's attitudes toward the impact from China on Taiwan's economic development. Surprisingly, on that issue, sorry, they are more positive than the older 
age cohort. That surprised me. I'm telling you. They are realistic. Okay? So I have a lot of students. They are, they have strong Taiwanese nationalism, but they are also willing to seek job opportunity in mainland China. So this is the truth. Okay? Very interesting combination. You like it or not? <laughs> yes, there's a generation gap in terms of perception on that issue. Maybe you can, you can say they're a little bit naive on this question, but this is their attitude. So how about self-defense? This is Professor Emerson Niu, Niu Mingshi, who is teaching at Duke University. He has conducted this survey for about 10 years. So I got his uh, most updated wave of survey data. He asked this question, if Taiwan has and mainland China go to war, what would you do? So it's an open-ended question, open-ended question. So you just give an answer. And then they will recode your answer into different categories. So remember that, it's a recoded analysis, okay? The way they record it, although I don't like it, <laughs> looks like this, okay? The biggest group is going with the flow. What does that mean? You tell me, how should I know? <laughs> People tend to escape into a safe answer, right? As I said, it's the biggest one. Run away, oh my God. 18% of them would like to run away. You tell me. <laughs> Pacific Ocean. Pacific. <laughs> Support government. Surrender. Defend only 10%. Wow, what a miserable picture. Break down by age. Run away. Oh my God. <laughs> Higher percentage of young people would like to run away. <coughs> And uh, so <laughs> it looks like that. So a very bad message that uh, this picture delivers. Uh, so this is my data. We asked, as I said, we asked two questions. The first question is, would you fight for Taiwan if Taiwan formally announced independence? that causes the mainland China to use force against Taiwan. So the precondition is if we declare independence. In other words, we're provocative, right? We're the troublemaker. And then would you like to defend Taiwan? Another question is, I think this scenario is more likely nowadays, uh, is this. Would you fight for Taiwan if mainland China uses force against Taiwan for unification? In other words, coercive unification, okay? So for the first question, you have around 56.7 people would like to defend Taiwan. Still, it's more than I expected, okay? More than half. And we ask a question, do you think other people would defend Taiwan? Not you, other people, right? <laughs> it's less, right? Less, 43. But if we go to the second question, it's almost 70%, 68.1% of the respondents that are willing to defend mm -hmm. Taiwan. And if you ask if you think other people would defend, 55%. Pretty rosy, actually. <laughs> Such a big difference. We ask particularly, are you willing to fight in Chinese it's about Zhan, it's about fight, okay? The question is very particular, it's not vague. Here's the breakdown of age. <coughs> this is about uh, independence. Uh, as you can see, there's a difference. If it's independence, they declare of independence, and that, that is to say, if we are provocative troublemaker, are you willing to fight? 
young people are, yes, there's a difference. Young people are more willing to fight. Okay? But uh, in the coercive unification, actually there's no difference. Still, young people are a little bit more, but no difference. Okay? All people are willing to fight. As for young people, they're 70%. Let's break it down even further. Okay, sorry. This has to do with democratic value. We, we were wondering if people's commitment to democratic value helps their determination of fight, right? So we separate into high democratic support, low democratic support. And this is on the independence issue, right? Uh, the high democratic support uh, that say yes, 64.5%. Uh, and uh, above 40, the, the number doesn't matter. What matters is that uh, democratic support seems to help a little bit. See, a little bit, but it's not that obvious. So we run, we, 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 we run a regression, and we found that democratic support is not significant. What is significant is here. There's a big difference. You know, this is higher than this, as you can see. So actually, people's democratic support, the, 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 their attitude to support democracy, commitment of democracy, helps their determination of de self-defense when facing a coercive unification. That makes sense, right? Because coercive unification actually threatens the democratic system, our democratic way of life. So people are more willing to fight. Okay, so Taiwanese youth are more willing to fight if declaring independence would incur war. There is no difference between the old and young in being willing to fight if China used force to, co to coerce unification. Commitment to democratic value helps the commitment to fight against China's threat of coercive unification. So the conclusion. The Taiwanese youth are not irresponsible or naive. They have strong commitment to democratic value and self-defense. Very simple. Taiwanese youth have stronger Taiwanese nationalism. That's, that is true. But the, the 20 to 29 age cohort have stronger tendency to maintain status quo. And it is also the biggest category among the four categories. In facing China's military threat of coercive unification, around 70% of Taiwanese are committed to fight. Democratic values help Taiwanese people to fight against the threat from China. So that is the message I would like to deliver today. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to take the prerogative of the chair to ask the first question. Did you do a gender breakdown of your responses? <coughs> yes, <laughs> definitely. How can I not? <laughs> In some of the issue um, regression, where have the uh, do I have the regression? Some of the issue is, is significant, and some of, of the issue not. Let me give you the significant ones. Uh, yes. The significant one is when Taiwan declared independence, would you like to defend Taiwan? Male are more inclined to defend. Mm -hmm. Male are more troublemaker than female. <laughs> In other words, that was the only place where there was a difference. Uh, if we ask for this, okay, I only run this regression on, on that independent dependent mm -hmm. variable. In terms of political uh, democratic value, I think it's the same. Mm -hmm. It's the same. Yeah. Okay, go ahead, please identify yourself. Yes. I enjoyed the, 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 the,
hard to think of comparisons between protests in China and Hong Kong. My question is, is there a party question? Is there any difference between if you do bad, you know, if you count or do you do versus paying to? I know the question is not well over, so I'll be more than address that. So that's my question. Party breakdown on which question? Well, generally, on the question of independence, you know, defending, you know, what, whatever you think is the, is the most significant question in any way. Okay. Can, can I take a few more questions and then sure, answer yeah. together? Sure. In the back? Yeah. Hi. Uh, my name is Leanne Schlepper, uh, former staff of the Transport Committee, now working in the design field, but also in the China Public Transit. Um, I was wondering, there were some of these that you mentioned just at the beginning, and this is the first time I heard kind of in talk, but I was wondering what the sample sizes were um, for especially this last, um, this last group that you pulled. Um, you know, and if you, you know, if these were answers coming from primarily the north of Taiwan or the south or specifically from cities or also from rural areas. And then also in that first, um, in the chart where you broke uh, the opinions down to those four different quadrants, whether they're, you know, pro-choice, pro, or, or you know, the, the other three categories, that um, I think it says were from 2005, um, which means that no, no, no. The literature was from 2005, but data is new. The, the data is new. Yeah. When? From a, a month ago. Oh, okay, great. That new. Okay, okay great. Just wanted to know about the sample. Okay. One more, Chris. Uh, Christian Merck at Apple Worldwide. I'm wondering if your if your uh, samples included people from Taiwan who are working in the mainland. Okay. And if so, you know, how many, what percentage? Okay, may I? Uh, answer this question first. Uh, these three questions. Um, so I answered the the sec. Oh, uh, yeah. Let me answer the two questions re regarding the sample. Um, the way we sample it, if this is conducted by uh, not by us, uh, we delegate to uh, National Zhengzhou University, uh, the Center for Electoral Studies. Uh, uh, Professor Emerson Niu also delegate to the same institute to do the research, the survey, so there's a stability in the data. Uh, so that's one thing. The way they sample it is always the same, is by uh, your home telephone number. Home telephone number, okay? Uh, the way we over -sam sample the, the youth is we make more phone calls. It costs us a lot, okay? So this is a very costly study. Um, so. Because of that, we cannot sample those people who work in mainland China currently. But we asked the question whether you or yourself, whether you yourself or your family member ever work in China. We have that question, you know. Um, uh, is it uh, the distribution north and south in party? So it's random. It's, an, it's, a, it's a national sample of telephone number, and then we randomly sample that, okay? So I have data of their distribution in the north or south. It's quite, basically, it's always the same distribution in various uh, survey. So basically, we don't uh, have issue with that. But of course, when we do regression, we have to weight the data according to national uh, uh, demographic data. Right, we have to wait that. Uh, so that's the question regarding the later two questions. Regarding the first party breakdown. <coughs> yes, the, uh, there is a very obvious correlation between party uh, between the party identification and many of these variables. For example, as you know, the KMT supporters, we ask them to identify themselves uh, with the party. You know, what is the party uh, identification? The KMT <coughs> supporters usually is um, more toward a stronger tendency toward unification, whereas the DPP or New Power Party uh, people, they're more toward uh, 
independence, that's for sure. Uh, but for the uh, defense question, the second self-defense question, that is if you're facing the threat from China for coercive unification, there's no significant difference, mm -hmm. okay? But for the first one, there's a significant dif difference. That is if we declare independence and there is a war, then KMT people are less willing to fight, okay. as you can expect usual suspect, <laughs> as you can expect. So that is the basic answer to your question. Yes. Uh, I'm Bill Ironbruster. I'm a retired journalist. I lived in Taiwan for three years during the 70s. And back then, there was significant distinction between mainlanders and native Taiwanese. Uh, does that distinction even really apply anymore? I mean, obviously, anyone born on the mainland would be late 60s or in, you know, 70s or above now. But in terms of the children and grandchildren of, say, the mainlanders, or, or has there been so much intermarriage and of, of, over the course of time? Is, is there any difference, really, in attitude? Well, um, in terms of age cohort, among the older age cohort, that still makes a difference. Among the younger ones, we're not sure because there's mixed marriage between, right. right? So you have to, and nowadays you have a lot of uh, new immigrants from Southeast Asia countries. And uh, yeah, the second generation of that category is becoming bigger and bigger. Uh, so the, uh, it's, it's getting complicated. Yeah. So usually survey like this, we don't ask that question. Because if you run a regression, it can be eaten by other variables. It's not that important. Party ID actually is more important. Party ID, you know, uh, because it depends how you ask. You ask your father, you ask your mother, or both. It's get it's getting very complicated, you know. Uh, and you have so many categories. So how how would you categorize the data? Uh, it doesn't make much sense sometimes. So we don't ask that question. But in terms of everyday life, uh, some of the second generation of managers, they are still have very strong bearing of the political attitudes they coming from their parents. Uh, still the situation, but people like me, I'm you know, very exceptional. I'm a second generation of managers. Both my parents are from mainland China. My father was a KMT official, and guess what? I'm pro-independence. That happens. <laughs> when I say pro-independence, I mean this context, OK? <laughs> John? Uh, John Oldman, former National Committee staff. Uh, my question is, um, President, President. Um, my question is, I don't know if you've done this, or is there data that talks about the, that addresses the question of the likelihood of the PRC, the mainland, using force against Taiwan? Oh yes, yes, yes. That happens. I do. <laughs> that I haven't done, but I have a distribution of their estimate. Can I ask this question first because it's data? Yeah, of course. Oh, give me a second. Okay. This is a very interesting question. It has to do. Yes, and when we run the regression, we will put that into our. Uh, okay. Yes. We ask in the fu t uh, future 10 years, uh, what would be the most likely scenario on cross-strait relations? U uh, unification, Taiwan independence, or status quo? Basically, the simple answer, right? Uh, those people, I, I'm giving you the answer in general, not, not breakdown answers. In general, those people who think we will, in, a, in the future 10 years, will be unified by mainland China is 11%, 11%. Taiwan independence is 5.4%. <laughs> Status quo, 73%. It's very obvious. Okay? I'm sorry, what date, when was this taken? What's the date? A month ago. Just a month ago. A month ago. Very fresh. Hold a second. Let me give you one breakdown. One breakdown. Those people between 20 and 29, that's what we're talking about. Young people. Those we think we will be unified by mainland China, 
9.7%. Those who think we will have Taiwan independence, Tian Ran Zhu, pro, naturally pro independence, 6.7%. The same. Status quo, 81.4%. But as I said, they expect status quo. You, you. Lots of hands. <laughs> But I was just wondering, I don't know if you looked at this, but whether, um, what is the opinion of, uh, of young Taiwanese people um, as it relates to um, should the mainland China use coercion uh, for unification purposes? Um, what is their opinion on the Trump administration and whether <laughs> the United States government um, will uh, send troops, um, particularly against the backdrop of uh, the latest uh, Taiwan Travel Act um, that is now on? I think it's been signed already. Yeah. We don't have that question in, <laughs> in our survey, unfortunately. But if you, because the, uh, if we ask that kind of question, it's, it's kind of tough what kind of answer we should provide for people to choose. Mm -hmm. we, I don't like open-ended question because it uh, doesn't give you a real answer for analysis. But, uh, but then if you ask what, uh, what would you expect the US government to do, it, 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 it's too many scenarios. Mm -hmm. It's co too complicated to analyze. Usually in a survey, we don't ask this kind of complicated questions. It's better to have interviews, you know, in terms of research methodology. In a quantitative uh, research, it's difficult to ask these kind of difficult, uh, complicated questions. But if you say, if you put into simple categories like uh, U.S. should apply military force to help us or stand by or something like that, you know, then I would say the majority, I, this is my guess, only my guess, more than 50% of people in Taiwan would say uh, we would expect U.S. to help us militarily. But when you say that, what does that mean? It's complicated. And, sell weapons to us, you know, you know so it's, it's too complicated. Uh, as for Taiwan Travel Act, I think it's overwhelmingly <laughs> welcome in Taiwan, although was not initiated by our government, I think. It was initiation by FAPA. Uh, for, we have to give them credit. They have worked on this for how many years? 20 years or more than that. Uh, so FAPA is an organization registered in the United States. The, uh, the Formosa Association of, uh, anyway, <laughs> the, this association. Uh, so, but I, I, if you ask my personal opinion, I would say in terms of de facto relationship is, in the short run, it's more symbolic. It's more symbolic than have real functional implication. Yeah. Let's go over. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shi. Uh, my name is Alice. I'm a student at Columbia University, and my professor is Andrew Mayhorn. Same as, as my mine. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I just I, met him. So yeah. I'm, I'm
Okay. Can I, can I collect more? Sure. <coughs> All the way in the back? We go above 20. Okay. No, because I'm wondering, like, in, in the United States, when we talk about the gun movement, you know, people who are 15 to 19 are now, you know, seven miles more small, you know, aggressively. So I wonder whether that would also happen at the, time, at the timeline. And then I guess the, the final part of my question is, early on you talked about conscription. I think Taiwan is moving to volunteer, volunteering, you know, self-defense, right? So how many, how many of these young people would have Okay, let me take one more. So let me answer these questions if I could. <laughs> um, first, uh, Alice's question, uh, if I correctly follow you, you were asking what can be done to pursue a peaceful resolution mm -hmm. on classified relations, particularly among young people. <coughs> I think this is definitely the right question to ask because there's a possibility to act upon. Uh, young people are flexible and full of possibilities. Uh, and the young generations across the strait, as well as in all the countries in our region, they have a lot of shared experiences. They use the same mobile phone, guess what? Uh, and uh, they're all on internet, although China has its own version of the internet. But uh, <laughs> Again, this is the age of globalization. Young people in all these countries travel more. They have more opportunity to, to uh, experience different cultures. So these are all positive factors. Uh, so I would say more programs of exchange, contact with each other, not manipulated by the government. This is a very important precondition. Any exchange manipulated by any government well, 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 dooms to fail, <laughs> I think. Uh, so let them talk to each other. And so we can work, s start with small camp for your institute to consider it programs like that. Small camps for young people to come together and uh, focus on issues like this. Let them use their imagination for new resolution, a peaceful resolution. And this should not only be conducted for people across the street, but also in the region. <laughs> All stakeholders, young generation in different countries, South Korea, North Korea, Japan, Taiwan, uh, or India, should be part of this camp interaction. I think now this, the world has become smaller. You know, uh, everything is intertwined together. So I think we should have more events like that. You know, I'm very passionate about this. Um, I, I don't like war either, but uh, there is a problem. Okay, so we, we should do something about that. And, and that's also the, the reason why I like this job. <laughs> because it's a job of action, taking action. I was academic. I like academic too, don't get me wrong. <laughs> but I like this job better, even more. Because we can, you know, do something to change the world. Uh, Max question. The answer is no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't have data to answer your question, but let me talk something about that. Uh, we don't know in this among these young people how many voted, uh, and we didn't ask this question either. 
but there should be some other survey in Taiwan. Yes, uh, TEDS. They have data, but I don't know if they have, <laughs> they, they didn't over sam sample to the young people, so I don't know if we can do the test. But uh, last time in the 2014, uh, uh, the election was administered under my administration. So a very difficult day was picked. And uh, that actually get a lot of young people pissed off. So they use their own money to buy the high speed railway expensive tickets to go back hometown to vote. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's what happened last time. So I would say the percentage of the turnout rate was not that low, but I don't have a concrete number, but that was the experience that we had. As for the 15 to 19 uh, age cohort, actually they were uh, also very active in the sunflower movement. You know, uh, they came voluntarily in the sunflower movement. Uh, a lot of uh, high school uh, students, they organize themselves. And a lot of parents, they came from the south to look for their children <laughs> among, you know, around the legislative yuan, and we helped them a little bit. <laughs> uh, so they were active. They are active, yes. Uh, in a lot of the campuses, they are active. Uh, in, say, like, in some of the campuses, there's regulation in the school that they are regulating, regulating that the uh, Female students should wear skirts, so they are moving against that. Okay, things like these, things that they care about uh, in their own life, they uh, stand out to, to protest. We don't have gun problem in Taiwan, but we have other problems. Uh, uh, yeah, the, the third question you ask: How many w of them would sign up to serve? We didn't ask that question. Uh, we can consider to ask this question next time. Um, uh, yeah, it would be more precise to ask this question instead of whether you are willing to fight. But the thing is, uh, again, it has to do with the cost of the research. It already costs us a lot, so we cannot put too many questions into the survey, but we'll think about that. Um, uh, uh, Alice's question regarding the general attitude toward peace and war. Uh, I, I don't think Taiwanese people are <laughs> have any appetite for war. <laughs> we are a small country and surrounded by big elephant countries. Uh, so in that kind of circumstances, even a war not initiated by us, by uh, you know, some are of our remote neighbors will affect us, and sometimes we'll get involved. Uh, not out of our willingness, it's very likely. So I don't think anyone uh, prefer war. But if we're invaded, threatened, then I already show you, people still have commitment to defend the way of life. I think that's the, the best answer I can give you. Thank you. Foundation does um, in addition to the research and, and what makes it fun? A lot. <laughs> okay, sure. Any other question? Let me let me talk about this. Yeah. Um, so um, I travel a lot actually. <laughs> uh, it's very exhausting, but I like it because uh, every time I travel, I'm engaged with some kind of international networks of democracy promotion. Uh, I have this feeling that uh, you know, we're a part of this global endeavor to safeguard and defend democracy. That excites me. Although sometimes it's only talk, but talk itself excites me already. <laughs> <laughs> because we, I think this is something uh, very substantial, very, very important. Because the threat is so imminent. It comes from all the directions. That's one thing. Another thing is um, I'm also involved a lot in the uh, think tank exchanges. Mm -hmm. So you meet people from different countries and uh, 
and you understand the perspective differently, you know, uh, that actually opens my eyes. A lot of things that we don't learn from theories of IR, actually, uh, because when you contact with people, you understand their emotion, uh, the lack of security, the sense of uh, uh, being threat, threatened, uh, or, or the reason why they're dissatisfied with current international order, things like that. And uh, I remember once I was in Tunisia, so it's uh, the only fruit from Arab Spring, and but the uh, so I was expected a kind of rosy picture. But that when, when I went there, I found that the this new democracy is really fragile. So I was not surprised when there was a street demonstration uh, not long ago, uh, because the economy still suffers. Uh, from the lack of opportunity of uh, development and a lot of young people do not have jobs. This threatens democracy, young democracy in particular. Uh, so uh, it gives me a very vivid uh, picture uh, of the difficulty of democracies <coughs> in different uh, corners of the world. And uh, also I was surprised by the fact that sharp power is very real. What's sharp sharp power, power, the threat of sharp power. So many countries come to Taiwan talking to us about this issue. And we didn't expect that. They were seeking our experience to exchange their experience with us. So you know, we were, we were working on volume studying this issue too, but the, uh, so people heard that, about that and they want to manuscript. I say, I haven't published yet, okay? <laughs> Wait for a minute, but they, they want to learn from us. They're so eager to learn about this issue. Uh, so this is a real issue. <laughs> it's not a theory. You know, it's happening everywhere. And the, um, the threat from the uh, uh, authoritarian regimes is getting more and more sophisticated, sophisticated, technologically sophisticated. And it's getting more and more difficult and they're making very, very good use of the vulnerability of demo democratic society. <laughs> that big companies of internet are not controlled by the government. Uh, sometimes they are not enough regulated by the law. You know, so there's a loophole and they make every possible use of that loophole, the authoritarian regimes, and making disturb the free atmosphere of speech and making us not trusting each other, making de democracy more and more difficult. So when I see this, you know, I think it's very important that we, we should work together to defend our commonly cherished values that is under threat. So this kind of thing really excites me. Whereas if I were academic, I just, write things about this issue, but no one reads. <laughs> Janet? Can I just follow up? Who are you? I'm Janet Eric. <laughs> um, I'd like to follow up on Susan's question a little more. So you told us why you're excited about working there and enjoyed it. But what about what actual program does the foundation carry out? You know, what do you do mm. on a day-to-day -day basis? Do you find, as a foundation, are you an operating Uh, any question related to this? So let me ask you, uh, uh, answer this question. We are both a uh, uh, grant-making institute and uh, uh, we also run our own programs. Uh, not like NED, NED only uh, give, gives uh, uh, grants. Uh, the programs that we run for, let me give you some examples. Uh, a lot of programs actually we, we collaborate with other organizations. Uh, we have, we have two journals, one in Chinese, one in English. Uh, these are academic journals, you know, not propaganda. So I'm not involved in the editing thing. You know, I delegate to some committee in order to maintain its credibility. Mm -hmm. uh, 
and so that people don't call me. So, oh, I have a paper there. I don't know. <laughs> don't let me know. Okay, I don't I have nothing to do with that. Uh, uh, we have some of the uh, our flagship events, such as East Asian Democracy Forum. Uh, that's a, a forum that we host uh, annually, and we also have a Asian Young Leaders for Democracy workshop. That around twenty young leaders uh, uh, that they, they have already dedicated uh, their career to democracy or human rights promotion uh, issues. Uh, from the region, uh, some of them can come from Iran or Southeast Asian countries or Northeast Asian countries. They gather together uh, in Taipei, uh, spend around 10 days together. Uh, and we have run that for how many years? Four or five years. Uh, and we also have this um, uh, Asian Award for uh, Democracy and Human Rights that we have annually. We give this uh, uh, award, uh, and, uh, I mean, 10,000 US dollars, how much is it? <laughs> Around that, <laughs> um, uh, to uh, the laureate of that award. So uh, some of the uh, human rights or democracy promotion organizations from the region uh, usually get that award. Uh, we uh, co-host, for example, uh, with a community of democracies for uh, regional meetings uh, or uh, WMD World Movement for Democracy uh, for regional meetings uh, or uh, Asian Network for Democracy for regional meetings, things like that. And we are also a uh, member of the International Steering Committee for the Community of Democracies, but we are not a full member of Community of Democracy because of the objection of some non-democracy country, <laughs> as you know. What is the Community of Democracy? It's the uh, international organization promoting de democracy. It's headquarters in, it's in Warsaw. Oh. And, uh, <laughs> but as you know, NED is, no, not NED, actually not NED. Uh, yeah, uh, Freedom House and uh, a lot of US organizations are also involved. Last year, September, United States supposed to be the host to host a, a ministerial meeting in Washington, D.C., but uh, due to some reason that you should know, it was delayed to the last minute, but eventually that happened. So a lot of, a lot of ministers were not able to come because of short notice, but we did uh, as a member of steering committee of civil society pillar, we, we came to Washington DC, was, uh, our civil society meeting was hosted by Freedom House, which turned out to be very fruitful. Um, in a time of such a difficulty for democracy, I think such a solidarity is particularly important. So, you know, these are some of the examples that uh, we have. Uh, uh, we also have some research projects. Oh, there's another thing we have, every year we run a project studying an uh, observation on China's human rights. So we publish a volume of that, okay? Both in Chinese and in English. It's available on our website. You can freely down download that, okay? Uh, what else? Yeah, that's some of the projects I can think of, yeah. Doug, why don't we give you the last question? <laughs> Another former president. Douglas Murray, I've been involved with the committee for a long while in one way or another. Um, it sounds from your answers to Jan's wonderful question that basically you are an operating foundation, much less, and maybe not at all, a grant-giving foundation. Uh, sorry, I didn't mention that part, yes. <laughs> uh, we are also a grant-making foundation, oh. but, but our grant is not as that much as NED because um, we make only small amount of grant to, mostly to the NGOs or academic institutions in the region. In the region, not Northeast Asia and South Asia and South Asia. Also in Taiwan, we have two parts. Okay, let me tell you one secret about TFD. <laughs> this is open secret, not, not, not real secret. <laughs> that is, we have certain amount of our bu annual budget allocated for political parties. 
political parties for them to use for public diplomacy, party diplomacy, and to promote democracy, of course. Uh, uh, because when TFD was established, we were trying to learn from many examples. Of course, NET is one, but another is uh, Westminster Foundation for Democracy. Mm -hmm. uh, Westminster Foundation for Democracy, uh, they are more focused in uh, assisting political parties because of the British parliamentary system. Mm -hmm. And also the German. Yeah. The German system, every political party has its own foundation. Right? right? But uh, we cannot have that because that's too chaotic for us, you know? Uh, so we have TFD, but a certain amount is allocated for different political parties mm -hmm. so that they can keep their hands away. Mm -hmm. And we keep our own independence. Mm -hmm. And it works. Mm -hmm. We have, a, let me tell you another secret that I'm actually, my title is president, but I have still have a boss who is our chairman. Uh, of the board of directors. The chairman is always the parliamentary speaker. Uh -huh. And our vice chairman is always the minister of foreign affairs. Hmm. And we have a board of 15 members. 10 of them, here's the secret, 10 of them are always appointed by political parties according to the proportion of their seats in the parliament. So among the 10 currently, five are appointed by DPP, the ruling party, three by KMT, the major opposition party, another two by the two small parties, TFT and New Power Party. Another five representing different sectors, such as academic sector, financial sector, uh, civil society sector, business sector, and lastly, the government, who happens to be the Secretary General of President's Office. So the board meeting is held, say like twice or three times a year. <coughs> I make a report to them. Usually they just ask questions. They don't give me precise directions. They allow me to run the institute on my own. But we, on our daily function, were closely, very closely monitored by multiple layers of systems <laughs> which is very painful, <laughs> <laughs> particularly on um, uh, a lot of things, uh, by MOFA, by uh, uh, aud uh, the, what's that, the auditing minister, uh, Shen Ji Fu, and uh, of course by legislative yeah. Every year when we present our budget, we have to go there Actually, not only during the session, but before the session, I have to knock at the door, bow, yes, and answer questions. <laughs> you know, democracy. <laughs> and usually, the one who sees me are not legisl legisl legislators themselves, but their assistants sometimes happen to be my students. <laughs> I still bow to them. <laughs> that's, that's my job. <laughs> yeah. Well, please join me in thanking President, Professor, <laughs> Dr. Xu. Thank you, thank you.